So thank you, Rachel. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm hoping, as Rachel just said, this is not just going to be me reading poems because I can do blah, 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 and we'll be done in 15 minutes. My real hope is just what this book is about. This is about sharing the song of life. And I can't wait to hear the ways in which you connect with some of these thoughts. And I'm gonna begin by reading a little bit of a buildup and sort of how I came up with the title for the book. Several years ago, Mark Dyer wrote a story in Episcopal Life magazine entitled, Singing Songs and Seeing Visions. A father and son, Mark wrote, traveling in a wagon, came to the edge of a forest. May we stop so I can pick some berries, the child asked. His father tried in vain several times to lure the boy away. I shall be moving slowly down the road, the father said, but I shall sing. When you cannot hear my song, know that you are lost. Run then with all your might to find me. The article went on to point out that to pray is first of all, to listen for God's song. God sings the melody. We sing only because we first heard the song. This is who I am, God sings again and again in the Bible. And this is how I care for my friends. God sings through our experiences and our reasoned reflection on experience. God sings through the stories that arise from our relationships with one another. Our spirituality hears the song of God through the early Christian communities who pass on their experience of God. We search the scriptures and test our stories against the biblical stories. We write the experience of our own lives on our own pages of life. We learn to sing the song. It's a privilege to me today to share my song with you and I'm really looking forward to hearing yours. The first poem I'd like to share with you, and I'll start by saying that in the poetry group here where I live, we study a lot of poets and often say to ourselves and each other, what in the world was that poet thinking? Why in the world did they write that particular thing at that particular time? And so in the book, I put a little note in the lower right-hand corner about what was going on at that time. And this poem that I'm going to share now to start us off is called Perfect Shells. I wrote it in 2014 when I was on the beach. When I was young and walked the shore, I searched for perfect shells that carried bragging rights and sharing them made me the best in the game of discovery. Now that I'm older and count the days that remain instead of from my birth, I'm drawn to the tiny iridescent ones, some broken, some wrinkled, none of interest to anyone but me. So fragile, they remind me of life. So light, the wind can cartwheel them out of my reach. They bring me a childlike joy, not for what they say about me, but for what I know to be true. That life is fleeting as the wind, reflecting radiant colors of the world around us, and we can hold it tenderly for a moment and have all the joy that we ever need to know. My mother had a clock that she wound every week, and I always watched that ritual. And when I inherited the clock, it ended up in a back room or in the bedroom, and I wasn't very often around it all the time. So when we moved to Arizona, the clock was right in the living room. And so it was a new experience for me to be in the same room with this clock that was so important to her. So this poem was written in January of 2013 and it's called My Mother's Clock. Never before have I lived in the same room as my mother's clock. It's easy to remember her faithfulness, lovingly winding it as I now do the same. But more remarkable than that is the steady sound it makes throughout my every day. And I sense the beat of her heart surrounding me still, faithful 
and never ending as only a mother's love can be. In August of 2019, my husband was in a memory care facility and I spent a lot of time with him, but I also had a lot of time by myself. This was still before pandemic. And I was fascinated to see how time was not like I thought it would be when I got older or when I was having to face living alone. So I wrote this poem called, It's About Time. They told me that time would no longer be my friend. They said it would weigh heavy. I'd be bored, they said. Time would be hard to fill. Little did they know that time is a sparkling gift when one sweeps clean the things so few talk about when they grow old. It's called the future. Turns out aging is not only about time gone by. Look ahead and wait to a new day. When time presents moments that call your name to be rolled around in and relished because in fact, you have nothing else to do. The clock is now my friend. I am awed when I find new hours or even minutes that I never had before. Just to be still and smile and welcome the chance to take delight in this new me. And then sometimes different things that we do every day took on a new light and became rituals that I had never really noticed before. So in April of 2020, this was after the pandemic started, I found myself writing a poem as I made my bed. It's called Praying My Bed. This morning, as I rose late with no reason not, I found myself discovering the beauty of making the bed. Every motion with intention, every touch with tenderness, carefully, smoothly, turning down the soft sheets. Thank you for a restful sleep, I said. Thank you that I have you to snuggle me warm when I'm alone. Smiling as I fold you in, anticipating your embrace when twilight comes. Wondering if every task could be turned back into such a time of grace. Imagine. And the day has just begun. And now we're going to make a big shift. Because right at that same time, our country blew up with Black Lives Matter, with pandemic, with quarantines, with violence, with broken places in our families as we tried to talk about these things. And particularly being isolated and this age when we wanted to be on the corner protesting or taking part in somehow or making sense, most of all, making sense. So I wrote this poem and I dedicated it to George Floyd and to us, written in June of 2020. How could they stand and watch their brother in uniform overwhelm and kill a fellow human being? How could they do that? Drawing attention to our own complicity, turning a blind eye to lynching, to mob mentality, to our own history. It's all part of who we are, the innocence, the hatred, the outrage, the horror that we see the love of family, the worry about their safety, the experience of the loneliness of an isolated observer. What next? Write a check? Speak out? Experience and welcome the shared pain that being human brings alive? Celebrate the connection. Challenge yourself. It's important work to do. Most importantly, celebrate compassion not only for others, but for yourself. Don't ever be too old or feel too helpless to be transformed by life itself. Don't just witness and grieve, even though that's a healthy start. Jump into the morass, muck around in the hard work of creating change. 
The world is most affected by those who bring their outrage to the table and love enough to make a difference, even if it's in only in their own hearts. Then the next day, I went to a piano concert. We have a very gifted resident here who plays holy music in my view. And I wrote this poem, it's called A Piano Piece, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Your music seeps into the dark corners of this troubled heart. And I wonder how you make this happen. Just as yesterday, I asked about the darkness that seems to be gaining ground around us all. Some days overwhelming all my sense of the very goodness of mankind. Then comes the melody, cleaning out the webs of sadness, the regrets, the drama. If there is such a thing as heaven, we are privileged to touch its hem so fleetingly. Play on, play on, wash away the sorrow. Welcome to the peace that only music brings. I'm looking forward to hearing some of your sharings about the difference music has made during this last year. And I wrote another poem um, because I was also facing things that either affected me negatively or positively, but facing dealing with them alone. So I wrote this poem in December of 2020. And the title is When Musicians Smile. Tonight, it was Andrea Bocelli singing Silent Night. There was that moment when he began to sing in his native tongue, and ever so briefly, he smiled. Yo-Yo Ma is another one, as he draws his bow across the strings of my heart. Watching him adds to the magic of his music. He seems to be smiling with me. All of my life, sharing these moments with someone else was doubled my delight. Now it seems I'm being called to learn about taking joy alone. Perhaps that is why the musician's smiles mean so much to me. Wouldn't I love to know what's happening for them? Something tells me it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Sometime later, actually this was in October of 2020, we're deep into the pandemic now. We've not been allowed to leave our community this whole time. Well, blessedly, we were not quarantined to our apartments. Many of you were quarantined to your homes. So that first chance that you got to go out was a big deal. And I wrote this poem about a trip. A friend of mine who had a car invited me to just take to the hills. The title is Rocky Mountain Tonglen, and I'm sure you all know Tonglen is a beautiful a Buddhist term for a form of meditation where supposedly we breathe in the pain and sorrow of the world and breathe out the holiness that is in us. Sometimes I play it backwards and breathe in the beauty of nature and breathe out my broken places. So this is called Rocky Mountain Tonglen. It had been a long time since we'd been able to get out of the city to walk haltingly over rocks and tree roots, up to the view spot surrounded by towering pines. Total silence. A gentle breeze came through, but the trees stood still for me and I froze in place. Then the stillness awakened that other sense that so often slips on by, you know, the one that affects us all the time, but we forget to celebrate its magic. It was the scent of pine cones crunching beneath my feet. Yet the air itself was empty. It was that purity that took my breath away. No smoke, no exhaust fumes, nothing to remind me of breathing where people live. Just the green growies, the smell of dirt, perhaps an animal passing by. If we did nothing else today, we breathed in truth and blew out weariness of what it takes to keep things going. And in some small way, for some even smaller reason, 
even if it was just one breath, I knew that all would be well. May it be so. Many of you perhaps were raised in the city or you know someone who was raised in the city and they never had the blessing of seeing a wild bird in flight or a four-legged animal feeding at your backyard. A friend of mine here in this community, way younger than I, had been raised in Chicago and had never witnessed any of these things. She also is a friend who is dealing with a tragic diagnosis where all of her days are spent in doctor's offices and treating her disease and really having very few joyful moments. And many days she would say, you know, Barbara, I'm not suicidal, but it would be okay. It would be okay if my time came. So this poem is called The Eagle and the Hawk. And it has to do with the night that she came in from a walk and I happened to greet her in the hallway. It was an eagle and a hawk, she said. It took my breath away, she said. And just a month before for a fleeting moment, she was ready to look the other way, wondering what the purpose was. So little joy, at least that she could see. And now, we take a breath together on this beautiful spring night and give thanks for life itself. Her shared delight was such a gift to me, unbidden as was her eagle and her hawk. Another experience that I'm sure is common for many at this gathering today is when we get to sit with a friend who knows their illness is terminal. They know they have a limited time left, but they also know that they have time left. So they really want to be fully present in life while it lasts. And she was a very, very close friend of mine. This was written in February, 2020. My husband passed in October of 2019. And I was with her for this journey and I just wanted so much that our time together would be a celebration of what's left and also a recognition of the, the brief journey we have together. So the name of the poem is May We Speak. May we speak of all the times when we were one with another, with nature, with that mystery that we trust, did we lose self in the sharing or expand it like spun gold into more than we were alone? May we speak without words of love? May we slip naked into that cool stream of life and never speak or think again of endings or beginnings? Never, ever again. This is enough right now. Never alone, you and I. And now we come to you, the beautiful people of Mountain Shadows. The very first time I came to Mountain Shadows, it wasn't just the gifted pastor leading us, but it was every one of you and your faith journeys and how generous and kind you were and the work you were doing and the faith you had through difficult times. So I wrote this poem called Once Again, and so, once again, God says, see all the ways I'm with you? And through God made flesh right now, right here, right in our midst, once again, you come to me with kindness. And I know, once again, God lives. There were some other things that came unbidden during this time. My bedroom faces west, so I have a view of the mountains, but I don't have the morning sun. And so I don't get awakened by the morning sun. However, one very early morning, 
I was wakened by the moon. And I wrote this poem called Moon Bath. This morning in that magic waking moment just before dawn, the full moon chose to bathe me in its light. A far cry from yesterday when I was awash in tears. May this light be an omen. One thing's for sure, it's already a special day. There was another time at Ring Lake Ranch in Dubois, Wyoming in 2003. I had the privilege of being part of a two week retreat with Marcus Borg. Some of you have read his writings and know how profoundly he speaks of post-Easter and pre-Easter Jesus. And so we were at this retreat together and learning by experience as well as by sharing with our minds. And I wrote this poem called The Christ. And it comes right after the poem about all of you speaking Christ to me by your behavior and your kindness. It was a religious retreat in Wyoming for heaven's sakes, really. A famous theologian challenged us with this question. How many of you have experienced the Christ? The next morning on a sensuously stunning hike as only the Rockies can provide, with eight hikers ahead of me, I chose to walk alone the slower quiet way. Then came the butterfly landing on my shoulder. She became the answer to the question but left me with another of her own. Can one share a holy moment unseen by others without it going away? Or do these moments change us? And that is how we experience the Christ. Is that what incarnation means? The next to the last poem that I'd like to share with you came the night that they announced about the pandemic. Not to be a pity party, but to tell you a story as I know we've all had times of hardship, so this will not be anything new. But my husband had passed in October and a week later, my daughter who lives here had a double mastectomy for breast cancer. And so the evening that we heard about the pandemic, it came to pass in Seattle, five miles away from where my youngest daughter lives, in a nursing facility where I'm, I was certain that people from there had gone to the same market as my daughter. And I was frankly terrified that I was going to have another loss to face. And so I wrote this poem about saying goodbye. Every day, in every way, I am getting better at saying goodbye. Not a skill I would have chosen. Yet as with many things unsought, I need it now. Goodbye car, goodbye house, goodbye pets, goodbye spouse, goodbye hobby, goodbye friend, goodbye children. When will this end? Like paper boats, they sail away where sunsets go, out of sight yet still part of who I am. Is there a better way to say goodbye? None of them feel good to me. Then with this skill, with the tears that must be shed, comes gratitude, quietly landing on my shoulder as a butterfly comes unbidden from its own dark shell. Goodbye, thank you, goodbye. Thank you, fly away, fly away, fly away. And then the sun comes up again. Anyway, anyway, anyway. So the last poem I have to share comes up a lot where I live because people meeting each other for the first time are saying, where are you from? Well, where I'm from is different than where my heart home is. So I often ask people, where did you love to live the most? 
because I moved here from Arizona, but I was born in Philadelphia, you know? And so for me, it was more about where my heart's home was. And I wrote this poem on a visit to Jackson Hole. I lived there for 40 years, blessedly. But when I was visiting there one time, I found myself asking the question, what is it about being here? that touches me so deeply and nourishes me so deeply. So I wrote this poem called Home of the Heart. What makes a place a heart's true home? One wonders. For me, it is where every cell is alive, not just a few. And the music I hear is being played on an instrument created before time began beholden, begotten, belonging, beloved, beheld. Rachel, I turn it back to you and I look forward to hearing the songs of your lives. Thank you, Barbara. I would like to encourage everyone to, um, you know, it just, it feels important that you hear an amen. And I just wanna encourage everyone to unmute your microphones and say amen. 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 Amen and amen. I feel extra privileged because I already have a copy of the book. <laughs> Um, and so I had the opportunity on occasion during your reading, Barbara, to read along. Um, by the way, we are recording this gathering. So if after you've obtained the book, you'd like to read along uh, to Barbara's having read to you, you'll have that opportunity. Now, however, uh, you have the opportunity to offer up what may have come up for you on your own heart. And there is no uh, particular expectation attached to that, only an invitation. Um, my own experience of poetry readings, and I've, I've given a lot of them and I've attended a lot of them, is that uh, it's really stirring. The spirit's really moving when you, you find that there is something that connects for you or something that shimmers for you or makes you say, hmm, or makes you want to uh, return to that poem or that place of which the poem spoke. Um, and so I'm actually going to invite us, because these are contemplative poems, because they are poems that so much reflect Barbara's gift for presence and mindfulness and attention to what is, I am going to encourage us to take a brief silence now and just be present to what is, and then... Um, I will offer a few words of reflection and then if others wish to share their song, they may do so as well. So let's hold a bit of reflective silence for a moment. Is it over, honey? No.
a very brief silence, but one in which I became more aware, Barbara, of the ways in which uh, your poems genuinely celebrate growing older. Um, there is no stridency about your poems. They're not polemical. They're not um, telling people how they should think or anything of that sort. But you are, it seems to me, speaking out of your own experience of noticing that to be given time and more time to grow older in time is in reality a gift. And I'm struck by the fact that you, you express compassion for those whose time has become very painful, um, such as the woman with the tragic diagnosis who said, I'm not suicidal, but it would be okay. <laughs> um, and so it's not as though there's some kind of um, willful ignorance about the fact that of suffering and of the suffering that, that growing older can sometimes bring. But there's this remarkable sense, it seems to me that you are able to articulate of each day being sweetened um, by the longevity of your life and each day carrying uh, a calling, it seems, to you to um, notice what is wonderful. It may be something as ordinary as making a bed, but um, you embody in your writing which can only come out of the way that you live, that we have the opportunity to, to revel in what we're given um, and that it doesn't have to be as spectacular as the Rockies, um, although it's great when it is, but it might be just as, as ordinary as a, as a daily household task. So I, I really want to thank you, Barbara, for um, reminding me to pay attention. And I wanna invite anyone, and I can be a kind of a, a facilitator if you like, and Barbara, so can you, of course. If anyone else has a word on your heart or on something you notice or something that came up for you um, as you listen to Barbara read or a question perhaps, um, Unmute yourself or raise a hand or both and, and let's hear from you. Marianne. Barbara, thank you. I love it that you can write poetry that address experiences that we all share. Your poetry really touches my heart. It was a gift to me, and I love sharing it as a gift mm -hmm. to you. Barbara, I think Marianne is not the first person to say your poems touch her heart. I, I believe there are others who have said that, and that is an extraordinary gift. I, I saw Jane's hand, and I saw Teresa's hand. Jane, go ahead. Hi, Barbara. Your poems remind me of a very famous poem, poet, Emily Dickinson. Oh my. Uh, <laughs> Emily sat enclosed in, in, in her house her entire life, passing her poems through the doorway to her editor. And she said this, and your poems remind me of this. She said, if I could keep one person's heart from breaking, I, I will not have lived in vain. 
And that's the whole thing about the transformative life that art and poetry and song gives us. Your music included. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, you know, um, I had an email yesterday. This is a gift. You know, I thought writing this came to me and as a gift, but now the gift keeps on giving because I had an email from a friend who, another poem that we didn't share today, I said that it had touched him and I said, oh, that's nice. And, and then he quoted the poem back that his experience of the walk in the woods when he was a young man holding his wife's hand. And then he read the word, it was like um, all these poems today about incarnation and the way we sh share. I said to Rachel in an email, it's like mainlining the Holy Spirit. When these things touch each of us, we are so connected. So thank you so much for what you shared. Therese, I'd like to invite you to share. What really touched me when you used the term um, a music piece and then you spelt it out P-E-A-C-E. -E. Th this whole time I'm like, wow, um, you know, what, what is my song of peace? And I, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I just was able to embrace, to really read, uh, with a learning disability that at 70 and I'm, I'm just really playing with words and making analogies and I'm <laughs> down on paper right and people are <laughs> laughing and my editor is like I don't know anybody else that writes that way in the middle of a sentence I'll say what you know and um, so that that's my piece of my love song and I, I just love the connection of music piece <laughs> music, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Thank you. What music speaks to you? Oh, bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> that old country, you know, it just, um, <laughs> heart and soul. It could be soul, the banjo. That's, that's that's awesome. Janet, I saw your hand up, and I know that you, Janet, are a published and practicing poem, poet yourself. I don't, uh, I want to invite you to unmute your microphone and, and share what's on your mind or heart. Oh, a cu couple of things, Barbara. One is, I love the range of your poetry. Everything from introspective to action, talking about George Floyd to nature. Um, you cover so much in, in such a um, moving way. And uh, I marked down, I wrote down all the poems I specifically loved, but you left, I'm a writer, and you left me with a fantastic prompt. And that prompt is heart home. So you can be sure that I'll be writing something when I can figure out where my heart home is. Please send I love me that your, concept. Send me a copy, Thank please. You. I'm glad, Janet, that you mentioned a writing prompt. I know that, as I said, you are a writer and a poet, as you said. There may be those of us in this room who don't think of um, themselves that way. There may be some who do. There may be some who've never tried writing a poem or um, have. Um, I'm interested, Barbara, if you, well, uh, let me say this. Um, I've taught a class writing as spiritual practice many times. And one time years ago, I had a scheduling conflict and could not teach that class and asked Barbara to substitute for me. And as you can imagine, uh, she did so beautifully. Um, Barbara, for people, whether they are experienced writers or um, want to just try it out and see what the song within them might be, do you have any practical uh, nudges or, or pr practices that you would recommend that, that help a person go from 
not writing to writing. And maybe the gift that comes to others isn't words. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's other kinds of sharing of which there are so many. Um, art, oh my goodness. Um, whatever you feel God calling you to do, but oh boy. Um, so much, the reason this is so dense, first of all, it was a crazy, crazy year. <laughs> So, you know, we all were up and down, but I had so much time. People kept saying, because I was a caregiver, now remember you have to take care of yourself, but they always had ideas about what that looked like. And for me, most of the time it was coming home and being by myself. Most of the time, you know, maybe a massage in there now and then, but, but it's the time alone is where God has space to come in. And then it was not possible not to write. For me, but, and, and just even little notes, um, little prompts. Somebody was just telling me today about something called uh, Story Share, I think it's not Story Core, where your kids can ask questions once a week and you write mm -hmm. answers. And I'm going to try and sign up for it as a poet to be prompted with a question once a week, just to make sure I keep, I keep the muse available. <laughs> so I would love to hear, hearing. I would love, I'm sorry, Rachel, go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. I would love to hear um, other people's stories of either sharing a loss or sharing a butterfly moment when they felt particularly connected to the holy in their midst, if people are open to sharing that. And if Does not, anyone have words for an encounter with the holy in your midst that you would like to voice, Fran, please go ahead and unmute your microphone. The one thing about this pandemic and being alone by myself, because my children live in three other time zones in the yes. country. Yes. Uh, I think about my life and why was I so blessed? Because I have been so blessed during my life. I mean, to somebody else, it may have been a drudge uh, for them to have had to move 10 times during their marriage, um, but it was a blessing to me and, and my kids even feel that it was a blessing to them that they had that privilege of moving uh, when they were younger, before they went away to college. And then, for some people having to experience and taking care of not just my mother and then my husband's mother and then taking care of my husband, uh, that would have been a, a, a negative. But for me, it wasn't. When I stop and think of what I have learned by those experiences, I've I really have been blessed because you do learn through things that I don't want to say are negatives, but are things that make you stop and think and depend on God because you cannot do it alone. That's right. That's right. And so I, uh, if I had to write something, uh, somebody else would say, oh, you're just boasting, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, just, uh, I just thank God every day. I just thank God for the, the life that was given to me, the good and the bad, because the That's good nice. always overcomes the bad, always. 
That's so wonderful. Yeah. Evidently, the switch in you, there's a little switch in us, I think. And some people, they think of their memories and it makes them sad because they wish they were back in those days. And other people, I happen to be one, and it sounds like you're one. Somebody turns the switch the other way. So the memories bring me to just so del much delight and gratitude. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, Barbara. Connie, I saw that you raised a hand and then Susie. Well, I can say to Fran, she writes through her knitting needles. Yes. And her gift of music and the notes that come from kindness. Yes. You write from your heart, Fran. Yes. And I think of the people that we've met. I mean, having the gift of meeting Barbara and ending up going to your property or Bob's property on the lake, um, how our lives are intertwined and how they come back together again. It's like music playing out and it comes back. Um, you know, life is just full of, of poetry. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susie, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Um, yes, Barbara, thank you so much, especially the poem that uh, described our situation during the pandemic, which which really were heartfelt. I, I could really feel them. Yeah. But on another note, the, my mother's clock. Yes. I, I have a clock that my mother had, and she used to wind it. And it was her dad's. It's a ceramic cl uh, clock that's painted. It's beautiful. But I have it way up high. I can't, you know, I have the key and everything, but I'm just kind of afraid to, you know, bother with it. But I've loved it my whole life. And to see a poem about it was a real gift. Thank you for that. Thank you. Barbara, you're having the delicious experience that uh, anyone who ever created and shared what they created uh, can appreciate. And that is to know what people's responses are to, to have some sense of writing, not into a void, but into a community yes. of beating hearts and receptive minds and whole people. And uh, I wonder if you might comment on, if you can, how your experience of writing these poems has affected you. Your, I, I have experienced myself sometimes as being transformed by the experience of writing maybe you have in your own way and I I wonder how you might talk about that if so um it's a little embarrassing <laughs> well you don't have to talk about it no uh, just because it's hard to say that I feel these were given to me because that that borders on egotistical you know but I will tell you, I keep the book of poetry by my nightstand and I refer to it because I forget or I need on, it covers so many different subjects um, because it's still, the words still continue to feed me <laughs> as well. And so, but the, the shock, you know, I felt called to get the book written and, and to get the words out there because they weren't mine, but the shock of having people I love and know, aside from strangers, writing these notes about uh, one man whose wife is deep in dementia, called me in tears and said, you know, I hate poetry. <laughs> I never was able to read poetry because I never understood it. And you've just said what I feel. And that's been, again, it, the gift just keeps going. So transformation, the transformation into 
how much more God's own I feel I am as a result of writing these poems, that I can no longer turn my back on that. And I'm sorry if that sounds egotistical. <laughs> what a remarkable statement. How much more I am God's own as a yeah. result of having written these poems. Absolutely. And I hope so much that every one of us, that every human being can have such experiences of the spirit who is life-giving and transformative moving through us to make us know that we are not on our own and we are not our own, but we, we are in communion with our creator. And I must tell you, Barbara, there doesn't sound to me anything egotistical about acknowledging that. On the contrary, on the contrary, it sounds uh, humble. Um, I realize that in our society, we're, we're reluctant to say things like, I'm a channel through whom God speaks. I, I get that. I get that. At the same time, one of the beauties, it seems to me, of our faith tradition is the audacious yet humble and true claim that we are children of God, that we are God's own sons and daughters. We are grown-ups of God. We are beings in whom God's own breath breathes. And so it, there is no credit we can take. I want to add to that because this will encourage people to listen for what they're um, called to express and to give. Um, some poet somewhere wrote that poetry is more about the eyes than it is about the words. And somebody else, some other poet said, thank God for poets. You think of all the remarkable moments that have, would have gone by without being noted except for you know, Mary Oliver writing about the geese flying or whatever. Um, but I would say that what got me doing this was again and again, coming out of a dark moment and having some, like the moon bath or the bed ritual, and all of those things I felt like saved my life, saved my life. And so I'm very grateful. And I love what Fran said and Fran's, prayer shawl wraps me up <laughs> and uh, the personal notes that people write thinking you know why am I doing this does it matter oh my god yes it matters there are a couple of people who had to leave this zoom room but they said in the chat how much it's meant to them Irene please unmute your microphone so we can hear from you Hello, Barbara. Hello, Irene, my special Sun City friend. <laughs> you remember sitting in your living room many, many years ago, and oh, uh, I... we were discussing whether you were going to sell your house or, or yeah, not. yeah. And I remember when your husband was was so ill, and you were so good with him. I remember so much, Irene. I watch well, you. And... <laughs> Anyway, um, they've said a lot about writing poetry, but would you believe that in my senior year in college, I took a course on reading poetry? Of course. And that I, I appreciated so much you reading your poems, oh, because yeah. for my final exam, I had to read poetry. And uh, it was it was just a thrill because that was required. I was not doing this for fun. I was doing it because I, it was required to get my final mark. And I, I read um, a poem that I still remember very well. But anyway, um, I just really appreciate the reading 
because that's where I get my inspiration. Is well, when, well, good for when you. I read them out loud. And good for you. That's great. That's great. And then get audible books too. If you can get the person that wrote it to read it is even, you know. <laughs> but sometimes when other people read um, the things that I've written, I'm shocked at how they read it. Like they put a different emphasis on another syllable, you know? <laughs> it's beautiful to see you. Good to see you too. I've heard you, Irene, do some oral interpretation <laughs> and uh, you are one of the very few people I've ever known who can stand up in church and and uh, give a moment for mission and get a round of applause. So, you know, uh, that, that, that course you took in high school really worked. Uh, college. 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 Oh. <laughs> uh, Dorothy, go ahead. And I think uh, we'll Dorothy's comment will be our last unless we have one more uh, person who's, who's hadn't had a chance to speak. Go ahead, Dorothy. Um. I am not a journaler. I write most of the time. Excuse me, Dorothy. We're sorry. I think people are straining to hear you okay. and we want to hear you. Let's see if this helps any. Is and we weren't seeing her right away either, but now, yeah. Is that better? There yeah. you go. There you go. Okay. Connie still says no. Um, <laughs> So I'm not a journaler. I fail at any expectation that that will happen. But <laughs> listening today, I was inspired by a combination of the beginning of It's About Time, yeah. followed by your anecdote of sharing with a sister resident. And I just wrote this called real people, real people. They said, they, they have too much power or do they? Sharing with someone, she said, we laughed. But remember love and the new or newer use of the pronouns and listen carefully for who the they is. Yes. 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 Dorothy, did you just write that in this time? Yes. <laughs> Barbara, there is no higher praise than <laughs> when your poetry engenders someone else's. How fantastic is that? That's lovely. Let me ask if there's anyone who uh, needs an, another chance or a first chance to offer a word if you feel so led. No pressure, just want to be sure that we're giving everybody that opportunity. Uh, Shireen, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Yeah, I, something came really strong for me while Barbara was right, reading, but then the poems went on and it's gone. So it must've just been for me uh -oh. and not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what stuck is one of, in, in the perfect shells, the wind can cartwheel them out of my reach. And just thinking about how much I mean, the wind has cartwheeled so many situations and people and experiences out of my reach. And all we have left is this, what we do with it in ourselves. So I guess that's what, that, that, that cartwheeling out of my reach and the gift that we have in remembering feels really important, so. That's beautiful, thank you, remembering. I like that. You saw that Shireen has a copy of Barbara's <laughs> book. I want to just uh, remind you of um, how to go about obtaining the book if you'd like. If you email 
Barbara Wood Gray, all one word, at gmail.com and tell her that you'd like to purchase a, a copy or more than one. Uh, Barbara will then send the book to you with a slip providing payment options. And the book is $20 per, that includes taxes and shipping and personalization. How wonderful is that? Barbara Wood Gray at Gmail. Dot com. I be can't sure imagine. Include, Go ahead, sure include, Well, be sure and include your address. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> you can't U.S. mail something with an email address. We have not yet perfected that delivery method. Um, but your, I will, oh, something else I would really like to affirm, Barbara. Um, not only are you a remarkably attentive uh, and, and specific, expressive crafter of the language, but you have crafted a poetry reading, your ability to introduce a poem and to flow from one to the next is just a, a work of art in itself. This has been absolutely a, a, a delight. And um, I feel that what you've offered to our congregation, this group of people today, has helped to start filling my cup as I prepare to go into a sabbatical that will, God willing, include some, some time for contemplative writing. And I commend that practice to all of you. Let Barbara be your, your example and, and your teacher. How wonderful it's been, how wonderful. Uh, one more time, I invite God's people to unmute your microphones and say, amen. Hey, Rachel. Amen. 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 Rachel. Amen. 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 Yes, Barbara. Yeah. I was going to, because this has been so serious, I do have a poem that's not in the book that I thought would be fun to end on. Since all of us are so privileged in our, um, our comfort and during this past year, the losses and gains and so forth, I wanted to share with you how oppressed I have been because I was born and raised a blonde. And so I wrote a poem about being blonde and I thought it might help us to end on a light note. So it's called On Being Blonde. It was the best of times and the worst of times for blondes. There was blondes have more fun and there was Goldie Hawn. <laughs> I believe it was discrimination. Lots of dumb blonde jokes mocking our stupidity. They were right. We were dumb, dumb enough to believe it. We were fodder for the jokes, laughing at ourselves, expecting to be ignored when it came time to speak our minds. Perhaps that's why I seem to be getting brighter as I age. After all, I'm not blonde anymore. <laughs> so God bless you all. This has been such a privilege, such a privilege. Barbara, do you do you know what what Dolly Parton? I love that you gave us an encore, by the way. Do you know what Dolly Parton said when they said that she was a dumb blonde? She said, "I know I'm not dumb, and I know I'm not blonde." <laughs> and look how wealthy she is, too, by the way. Uh, and brilliant. And oh, uh, thank you for your artistry. Thank you for your spirit. This has just been a joy. Let this uh, event remind you that we can do stuff like this yes. uh, in the church, that it is good. And indeed, Janet Reeves and I and others are conspiring so that we hope very much that when things physically reopen and we regroup in person, that we will have a celebration to uh, hear Janet's poetry. Yes. So that yes. is something to look forward to on a on a date to be announced. Thanks. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Barbara. you all. Thank you. Thank you. God's blessings. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Amen. <laughs>